Um, although RIS V is, is um, free and open, designing a new chip, designing a, a new chip using advanced semiconductor process is very expensive. Um, what we propose is a mix and match paradigm where we combine the state-of-the-art memory technology with a more mature basic logic process uh, to reduce the development costs for near memory computing architecture. And this talk is going to be about, uh, you know, why that's a good idea, how it could be done. And I'll present two examples, a machine learning example and a supercomputing example later on. So first, why stack memory? Well, there's, there's a technical reason and a business reason. The technical reason is that by putting the SRAM on top of the logic as shown on the left node, you can, you know, the, the planar version or the, the on, on a same large silicon chip version is on the right. So the yellow is SRAM and the green is logic. If you um, put the SRAM vertically stacked on top of the logic, you reduce the distance from the SRAM to the node logic, and you also reduce the inter-node communication um, as shown in the picture. So that's the technical reason. There's a business reason, which is to reduce development costs. If you can design a stacked memory that can be used for several accelerators, you can amortize the cost of some advanced memory technology for the stack memory and design the logic using a more mature um, basic um, process. And then you would be able to create multiple accelerators, each of which the, the development cost would be lower. So I'll get into more of that later, but this is the summary of the talk. So the agenda here, first we need to talk about economics and technology and why I, you know, we needed to, to come up with a, with a scheme like this. Then I'll talk about the accelerator architecture and give a couple of examples. And then um, talk a little bit about programming model and how the performance evaluation works. And then the memory technologies that come in the future. Now, I should point out that there's lots of interesting accelerator architecture that are possible. We propose a specific um, solution for in-memory computing. Um, that's what this talk is about. And, you know, you, you can, of course, design lots of other kinds of accelerators that are not related to stack memory. So there's a paper um, that if you had um, the PDF to the slides, you can click on that link. Um, it's um, also on my LinkedIn website. So first, why specialize? Um, well, you can get efficiency in performance and in energy when you specialize. So uh, you know, the, the classical example is GPU. GPU is specialized for graphics and um, SIMD numeric computing. And you can see the chart there that tells you what the progression of efficiency of GPU versus general purpose CPU. And it's, it's much, much, it's both more efficient to begin with and getting more and more efficient faster than general purpose CPU. So this is the reason we specialize architectures. Now, there's economic considerations when you build products. Um, the cost of a silicon device is basically made of two parts, the recurring cost, which is uh, materials, and the non-recurring cost, which is the engineering that goes into um, the design. For silicon chips, um, the non-recurring cost can be very high. Um, so the chart on top, the, the colored bars, is from a talk on the web somewhere and they estimate that it costs 500 million dollars to do a to design a five nanometer chip now you can argue about exactly what the number should be is it 500 million is it 250 million is it a billion dollars we don't know but um there's no question that the trend has been getting more and more expensive and 
if you look on the chart there, a 28 nanometer mature technology from say 15 years ago um, to today, there's a 10x difference. And I think whatever number you choose for that, there's a 10x difference. This comes into play because if you spend $500 million to develop a chip, and if you can sell 50 million devices, such as like Apple mobile phones, then it only costs you $10, $10 per device to recover the development cost. So it's no big deal. But if you can only sell 100,000 of these devices, then you need to charge $5,000 per device, which is kind of a lot. <laughs> so this is why you see mobile phones um, made using five nanometer chips, but you don't find, for example, um, even GPUs are not yet made of five nanometer technology. It's like 12 nanometer technology and going to seven. So that's because they can't sell as many as mobile phones. So the problem we wanna solve is that while this five enabled hardware innovation by a smaller organization because it's free, uh, have no licensing fee and no limits on customization of the ISA. And it has an open source software ecosystem, which is free. But to create a commercially competitive accelerator, um, it's still very difficult because if you do leading edge semiconductor, it's super expensive and you have to dream up a product that can sell in the tens of millions of copies, which is very rare. And at the same time, if you do something which is very different and novel ideas with novel architecture, it, it always takes a lot longer than you imagine for it to gain traction in the market, even if it's a wonderful idea. I mean, even GPUs, you know, we developed those things back in the 90s, but it took like a, more than a decade for it to become mainstream. Um, so the solution that we want to propose here is that the because of this end of Moore's law thing that you read in the newspaper, there's been rapid advances in packaging technology and people are doing multiple chips on substrate. It's now quite common. Um, like all the AMD processors are done this way with multiple triplets. People also do uh, chip and wafer stacking. TSMC has a, you know, it's a, has a whole product line called 3D fabric to help you do, do that. Um, GPUs are using stacked HDM memories on a substrate, all inside a single package. And the, the new AMD processor has a stacked SRAM on top of the CPU. So it's quite possible to mix and match memory and logic with different um, levels of technology. And what we propose is to stack advanced memory technology on mature logic technology and to amortize the cost of designing the stack memory over multiple uh, designs. So here's some examples of recent um, accelerators. Uh, GraphCore has been quite successful. Um, Cerebras is very famous for making wafer size. And then uh, Tesla just recently developed a, something called Dojo. What they all have in common is a lot of local memory. Um, they're all very large chip, or in the case of Cerebus, a whole wafer. But if you look, a lot, a very large fraction of the chip is actually memory. Now, this this type of computing is sometimes called in memory, sometimes called at memory, sometimes called near memory. So you know, the the press uses these terms interchangeably. Um, but the press claims that the global in memory com computing market. It's going to get very large, you know, $40 billion um, fairly soon. So they, they're expecting good things from this technology. Um, now I should say that memory chips are different from ASIC because, um, you know, and flash, DDR, LPDR, even HBM are very high volume chips because you, you, the same chip is used in many different products as, and also in a single product usually use memory, many memory chip connected to one logic chip. So the volume of memory chip is quite different from logic. Um, the, and there are different kinds of memory technology. You, could, you know, DRAM and flash, for example, are very um, 
they require dedicated memory fabs to build them. So they're not very flexible, but they're very low cost. Embedded memory, um, you build in a, in a logic fab and it's less inexpensive. But on the other hand, it's, it's easily customizable, like ASIC. It's much more flexible. So that's what we're going to use. So the mix and match um, paradigm is that, the, so as I was saying before, the monolithic in-memory computing chip, like, like graph core and servers, they, they use very advanced logic process um, to make dense memory, but, and also very high performance uh, logic. But there's not that much logic on these chips because there's a lot of memory. A lot of the space is used for memory. And so the, the advanced gate process, you know, advanced transistors for logic gates are not fully utilized. Um, at the same time, you have these long wires that have to go from the logic island to another logic island, and it burns energy to go over the SRAM. So what we propose is very simple, right? We just separate the logic from the memory and stack the memory on top. And then you, um, so the memory is now much closer to the logic because you, you go vertically and the vertical distance is short. Um, and then the logic can get from one island to the next um, because they're contiguous. So the wire length is minimized. So, Wafer stacking technology. So this is, um, uh, you, everyone's familiar with this by now because HPM memory uses this, right? You take, um, you take wafers and you bond them together. I'm showing the picture on the right. You bond the silicon wafer, you, you, um, you grind them down to thin them to about 30 microns and then you bond them together. And then afterwards you dice it up. So this is very, uh, good for cost because you're bonding the entire wafer, which has hun many hundreds of chips, of memory chips. Um, you bond them all in one operation. However, the yield uh, would be a problem if it was a logic die because the yield is equivalent to the to the sum of the area of all the stack together, right? Because you bonded it together and then you cut it. So if there's a fault anywhere in the stack, you have to throw the whole stack away because we've already bonded them together. Um, for memory, it's okay because we can build memory with redundancy and basically trade off um, area for fault resistance. And so we can make the yield uh, high even when the chip is large or stacked up. For logic, this is not a good idea. So another technology is chip stacking where the chip is first diced and then tested, and only the known good dies are stacked on top of another known good die. So this is all the same advantage of um, short vertical in interconnect, and so it gives you good performance of power, but the yield um, can be much better because you test, you, you dice up the chips and you test them first, and you only bond good chips to good chips, right? Now, of course, it's also a much higher cost because you're, you're now bonding individual chips rather than a whole wafer at a time. But for logic, this is a good idea. So what we are proposing is to build a memory stack using TSMC seven nanometer SRAM, which um, is roughly two megabyte per millimeter in density. And we choose a, a stack area, um, of six, uh, 66 millimeter. Um, because the sweet spot for memory chips is in the 50 to 100 square millimeter range. If you make much bigger chips, then the, um, you get a lot of losses around the edge of the wafer because chips are rectangular, but the wafer is round. If you make them much smaller than 50 millimeter, then you lose a lot of area to the, the dicing, the sawing, because you have to have a what's called a saw street where the, where the saw goes through the cut, so you can't put any logic there. And the smaller the chip, obviously, the more area you're going to lose to sawing. So people have known for, you know, long, long time that this is why all DRAMs are in this range. Um, so we also choose, you know, 66 is good because it gives us um, an even number of, of megabyte. For each die, it gives us 128 
megabyte. And so eight layers together gives us one gigabyte. And it has an equivalent silicon area of 531 millimeter. And we're gonna show that we can, we're gonna get four terabytes for bandwidth using 10% through silicon via area. Um, now, being that the, the XY area of the, of the stack is only 66 square millimeter, you can make a big logic chip and put multiple stacks on top. Right? And the yield will be good because, well, the yield is, is whatever the logic chip is. And so obviously, if you make it really big, the yield is lower, but putting the memory stack on doesn't degrade the yield because you test the logic chip separately from the memory stack. Okay, now the logic chip. We're proposing to use some mature technology like Global Foundry's um, 22 nanometer or TSMC 22 or 20 nanometer ultra low power things. Um, these, these processes are widely used by the Internet of Things um, market. They're um, sort of medium performance today and they're quite low cost to do. The, the mass set is is not that expensive, and the CAD tools are are inexpensive by now. The libraries, there's lots and lots of IPs available, so it it's relatively easy to design chips, and lots of universities use these processes. Um, now, for the memory stack, the we said it was 66 millimeters square, and they're divided into 128 logic uh, tiles. And underneath each memory tile is a logic tile of the same size, which is half a square millimeter. With a 22 nanometer process, half a millimeter of, of logic is about 1.8 million gate equivalent, which is about 12 64-bit floating point unit. So you can get an idea of what, what I'm choosing a tile size to be. Um, so underneath each memory stack, there, there's the equivalent of 1,500 double precision floating point unit in logic area, even for these mature processes. So the platform architecture that I'm going to propose is um, so it's a it's a large logic chip, 24 by 28 millimeter, in which you put eight of these SRAM stacks, and um, so altogether you get a hundred. Uh, 1024 tiles, because well, there are 128 each, um, under each memory stack. We'll run it for an easy one gigahertz um, frequency to make all the math easy. And these 1024 tiles are connected by a 2D torus um, with 32 bit links. Now, the important thing is that a tile is a complete computer shown on the right. Um, it has a bunch of um, SRAM banks, and um, it's divided into four quadrants uh, for a shared memory, a, a very normal shared memory multi-core architecture, an SMP architecture is what the tile is, and it's connected to neighboring tile with um, with this 2D torus, and it, it can make eight 32-bit memory references per cycle for a total of 32 gigabyte per second per tile. Okay, so it's a it's a little computer with a lot of memory bandwidth. Now the manufacturing ecosystem. Oh, and I should say the paper that I alluded to before has a lot more details about the, the you know the microarchitecture and all this stuff. I just can't go through all that right now. <laughs> Not enough time. Um, the manufacturing ecosystem for this stack of RAM um, is is quite I wouldn't say mature, but it is um, it is available. Um, TSMC has been developing stack memory technology for quite a long time, and the first um, sort of high profile shipping product is this AMD uh, thing, which came out a couple months ago, with a stack. This is what AMD is calling the 3D V cache which is basically a big pile of SRAM on top of the AMD processor triplet. Um, but TSMC offers this technology to, to everybody. It's not 
cheap, but it's um, available. The CAD tools, the TSV fives, and all the stuff is, is exist. Now, whether they want to mix, you know, map these advanced memory chip on a mature logic process chip is a business decision. You need to convince them that they'll make money. So it's not a technical problem. Okay, I'm gonna show a couple of examples. So to motivate why this works, um, we've chosen these examples for simplicity of explanation so that they're not necessarily the most efficient things to do. So you need to keep that in mind. And then I'll talk about the programming model and the simulation environment. So first example is a high performance computing example for sparse matrix um, computation. Um, so this accelerator, which is this eight stacked, eight stack on a big logic chip, will have eight gigabyte of embedded memory. It, it does four teraflops of double precision performance, and it, it's a 250 watt PCI card, much like GPUs. But it has eight bytes per flop of memory bandwidth from this embedded memory. So this is a big difference because a GPU gets 0.1 byte per flop. Right. So this is a lot more. Um, the logic part is going to consume about close to 150 watts and the SRAM less. Um, and we're, we evaluate this using the HPCG benchmark, which um, you know it's a really well known. HPC benchmark. Um, and again, the, the paper has more details on, on the design of this thing. But we compare it to a state-of-the-art GPU on the NVIDIA A100, which at the time I made the slide was the most advanced thing at seven nanometer. I think they're coming out with the next, the hopper, um, or something like that next, or the Ada Lovelace or whatever. I, I forget the name, but the, there's like a five nanometer thing coming out very soon. Or So this may not be the state of the art soon. But anyway, it's seven nanometer. It's a giant chip. It uses five or six HBM 2E stacks and 250 watt shown in the picture on the right. Um, so we compare this stack chip to that. And this is the table. Um, so first off, the memory capacity is much less. It's only 10% um, of the GPU because the GPU uses HBM DRAM and we are using SRAM. The peak teraflops is also much lower um, because the GPU is optimized for doing a lot of dense matrix arithmetic and we're optimized for sparse matrix. So, However, the memory bandwidth terabytes per second, even with HBM, they get about two terabytes per second, with, whereas we have 32.8 terabytes per second using the SRAM because it's an SRAM. Right? Um, so we get 78 times more bandwidth, although we have only 10% the capacity. Um, so because of the high bandwidth, the bytes per flop, we get eight bytes per flop of memory bandwidth, whereas they get on a GPU 0.1 byte per flop. Right. Um, so on HPCG, which is a um, sparse matrix uh, computation that is very bandwidth intensive, um, they get, even though they get the peak is 19.5 teraflops, they only get 0.227 as a paper on the web says. Um, Whereas we estimate we can get 2.9, so a 13 times improvement, strictly due to the memory bandwidth. The FPU utilization um, can do about 70 percent. Um, whereas theirs is very low because they don't have enough memory bandwidth to feed the FPU. So um, and the power is about the same. So the, the gigaflops per watt is much improved. So this is one example of how specialization can um, help you, right? Um, now, this thing would only be good for sparse matrix 
computation. It doesn't do graphics. It doesn't do Lintac and all this other stuff. So if you need more general purpose GPUs a good solution, but if you specialize, you can get a lot of efficiency, a lot more efficiency for a specific thing. Another example is a machine learning example. So yeah, here, so, so oh, yes. Come back to this, like, here you know what kind of architecture you have. So you are getting better performance. It's very easy because you have more money. Yes. So this part, there are another tools in the architecture because 70% in a spark matrix is a low. So what kind of architecture, what kind of, what kind of architecture? Well, are you using how to manage the access to the sparse to the vector with the sparsity? How do you do that? You don't have any. No, because I'm using S. How do you get this number? Because we know how they. Uh, yes. Okay, and we don't need uh, 8 gigabyte, have 8. So there are plenty of numbers here that uh, I don't know how we can compare. Um, compare well, okay? because are you saying that if you have more bandwidth, you have. One uh, 64 bits per block is a lot. Obviously, the problem with the conjugate gradient is the bandwidth. Yes. So you are getting uh, improvement of performance because the bandwidth is, is trivial. The second thing is that are you getting additional performance because the architecture? Because I didn't see that. No, I, I didn't see what kind of simulator are you using, what kind of architecture. Well, it's one processor, it's vector, it's a scalar, how many processors? I am only relying on the fact that the memory. I see that Pierre has, has not. I see Pierre of the Hammer, 19.5 peak. I don't remember. It's, it's a lot. Probably you are right. I don't remember. No, it's not the Hammer, because the Hammer is 30. But then Pierre is 19.5. I don't remember. So these are, these are the, 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 the why you were performing. Beta flow, 20. Okay, the other one, four, five, okay. But the bandwidth is two and 32. Have huge bandwidth per flow. Yeah, and also random access because it's SRAM. Ah, I didn't get, I didn't yeah, see it's... how much you get because the bandwidth and how much you get because you have better bandwidth utilization. Right, so it's, it's random access, so basically the, there's no degradation in getting the, the random X access, access to the X vector in the sparse matrix because effectively the main memory is like a cache because it's made out of SRAM. <laughs> so I have random access to anywhere in the, right, in the memory. Access, uh, the access to the vector is sparse. So to see how you get back. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we can discuss more. I have yeah, I can show you the paper. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, the, the, the main advantage here is the SRAM memory is high, very high bandwidth, very low latency, and random, completely random access. That's yes. what I'm attacking advantage of. And the efficiency uh, that how comes. Channel, how many channels you have to access your I have um, 8,000 channels. Okay, so this is... <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> this is, if you win this, you have 8,000 channels. But then I, so I get high I efficiency <laughs> because I threw away the unused floating point unit that would have been on the GPU because I'm not proposing to do dense matrix. So since I can't use all this GPU, I just don't have all this so GPU. You have the matrix and the vector in memory. Yes. And you can access very quickly because you have 8,000. It's like an 8 gigabyte vector register. Instead of having 16, you have 8,000. Okay. So, uh oh, not working. No. Memory on. Uh, so Sorry. much talking made the computer <laughs> mad. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, you need to share the screen again. Yes.
Okay, are we good again? So machine learning example. And here, I, there's a paper on the web um, called Ultra Low Precision Forward Training of Deep Neural Network by IBM Research. So I chose this not because I'm particularly in love with four bit precision numbers, but because it's just a good example. We can get lots of ops for low power. Um, so it's the same basic structure, eight gigabyte of uh, memory on this large logic chip. But in this example, I can get 262 tera operation per second, where a op in this case is a four bit multiplier with a higher precision accumulation. Now, um, I also would choose this design to run at low VPD at a lower uh, frequency because there's lots of parallelism. So in, instead of one gigahertz, we reduce it to 500 megahertz by reducing the voltage, which saves a lot of power. And as a result, we can get 3.9 tera ops per watt of energy efficiency. Just, you know, it's okay. It's not the greatest in the world, but it's quite, it's quite respectable. Um, but I show this, and the paper has a little bit more detail, but this is, I'm just showing this just to give you an idea of what you could do with embedded memory. Right? There's a lot of things you can do because having a lot of bandwidth very nearby is a very powerful concept and being random, totally random access. Okay, now, at the beginning, I talked about reducing the development costs. A, a big part of development costs of accelerators is the programming, the software side. And what we're proposing is a mainstream programming model, which is a cluster of computers that you have today on your um, you know, data centers and supercomputers. They're all clusters of computers. So in our case, a tile is a computer, an, an array of tiles is the same as a cluster of computers in terms of programming model. Um, each tile is a multi-core SMP, just like your, your Linux server. So the difference is a matter of scale, right? The, oh, and then there's a network on chip, which is like your, your infinite band or Ethernet network. It connects them together. And obviously there are performance differences. So the, the big difference between this, this cluster of computer on one chip versus your regular cluster, it's a matter of different scale. Whereas your normal server uh, cluster, each node has gigabytes of memory. We only have megabytes of memory per, per node. Right? So each tile has eight megabyte of memory. So it's like a thousand times smaller scale. Um, on the other hand, we have lots and lots of nodes, you know, a thousand, a thousand um, server, cluster is quite a big cluster in normal life, but we put it on one chip. Um, so the, the important thing about this is that it's the same programming model. So you can develop the code on a regular cluster. And obviously you have to pay attention to the scale of things and not use gigabytes of memory on every node, but you can debug your program on a normal server and then tuned it on a simulator. Okay, instead of doing the whole development on simulator from scratch, this is a big help. This reduces the development cost a lot. Um, so we provide the same application programming interface. It's basically a Linux um, system called API. And where the in each tile, the little computer, it has a very thin, very small, it's like a hypervisor. And what it does is it intercepts the the inner um, it, the the network communication that goes from tile to tile, and we do that for you. And everything else, we but basically um, act as a proxy for the host processor. We just ship off the system call to the host processor and let it do. But you get the same API. You get Linux threads. You get sockets. You can do RDMA. So the co-design methodology for the software and, uh, and this, the specialized architecture is that we develop algorithm on a standard cluster of SMP servers with normal Linux, um, but you pay attention to the scale. And then you um, 
simulate, and I'll talk about it in the next slide, a uh, thread per core kind of simulation. And you can do this co-design and tune the application this way. So I've developed this Kava tools. This is actually what I did here at BSC the last year. Um, and it's open source and was supported by BSC. And then I gave a talk at the last year's ICS conference on this tool. But there's a simulator called Kavia and it presents a RISC-5 user mode Linux virtual machine interface. And it works on multiple cores of your host um, computer. So it does a thread per core execution. It runs OpenMP and MPI um, out of the box. It, uh, you can put custom instructions in. Um, and two days ago, I ran a 1024 node HPCG under MPI on the simulator um, on a new computer I just bought. And um, I was able to get one MIP per simulated core on a thousand core using an eight core AMD uh, processor. So it's pretty fast. And it got the right answer because HPCQ tests this answer and it, they got the right answer. Um, so the paradigm for simulation is just like this. There's this array of tiles which turns into Linux processes and the SMP cores, they turn into threads on Linux. And of course, you have to do all these um, atomic memory operations, which will translate to compare exchange on the x86. Um, and the network on chip is just the network on the Linux machine. And I have this tool called ERZ, which is the really cool part, which I can't show you today because no time, but you can actually look at the simulator innards while it's running. And it tells you things like, it gives you, you, know, you can paw around the assembly code and it, for each instruction, it tells you the cycles per instruction with that instruction. So it tells you the pipeline stalls, if there's instruction buffer misses, and you can also look at traffic between tiles. So that was in this ICS talk. Okay, now the main problem with, so SRAM memory is really great. You know, as you can see, it, it, it lets you design really powerful things. So you do sort of specialized things, but it's very expensive. Um, so the question is, do we have a path to something more affordable? So there is this thing called magneto-resistive memory, MRAM. And there's a lot of uh, progress being made on this, and this very technical stuff you can read about on the web. But essentially, it's a non-volatile memory whose uh, read time and read energy is similar to SRAM, but writes are a little bit slower. It used to have these all non-volatile memories used to have wear out problems, but this seems to have gotten solved recently. And it has great potential for reducing the SRAM cost because the seven nanometer SRAM is about, as I said before, two megabytes per millimeter. And it's not getting much better over time because SRAM is not scaling the way logic gates are scaling. So when you go to five nanometer, it doesn't get twice as much. You know, it gets on very little bit more. Um, on the other hand, this MRAM, even in 28 nanometer, they are already shipping products better than one megabyte per millimeter today, shown on the thing on the right by this company called Everspin. And it's not volatile, so it's really great for mobile devices where you can turn it on and off. And lots of people are working on stacking these MRAM cells the way um, there's this uh, technology by Micron and Intel called 3DX Point, which is now ships in the Octane memory, which is a stacked non volatile memory. Lots of people working on this kind of thing for MRAM. Samsung just uh, announced the, um, they built the MRAM based in-memory computing, which is sort of like the same idea that I have here, except that the memory is based on MRAM. So in summary, what I've shown you is that there's a risk, we have a RISC-V platform, we have a design for high bandwidth, low latency, stackable SRAM memory. There's this standard Linux programming environment and you have simulation tools to help you validate the performance. And the idea is you design the 
arithmetic, the interconnect, and the software for your accelerator, your specialized accelerator, you can add your special sauce, and you can do this, you know, without spending $500 million. And that's it. So, in conclusion, um, while RISC V enables hardware innovation, the development costs limits creativity. So, we propose a paradigm that mixes and match um, advanced state-of-the-art memory with mature logic technology. And we hope that it enables commercially competitive accelerators based on novel ideas by smaller organization with less money. Um, and in this way, you know, we can we can help the RISC V um, ecosystem bloom. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, so, because we have hybrid mode, let's prioritize the, uh, let's say, physically here folks uh, to see if they have questions first. Uh, and then we can move on to uh, Zoom folks. Any questions in the audience? Okay. Um, how about in the Zoom? Uh, if uh, if you have ah, the, sorry, there is one one question online question. Hold on, Zoom folks. Okay. Uh, thanks for the uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh, there is the concept of in memory computing and near memory. Uh, I saw in some slides that it's mentioned in memory. Is there a clear boundary between presently? So yeah, I I'm very confused myself in. In academia, there seems to be a distinction. Um, there are papers about in-memory computing where the computing is inside the memory array, like using the bit line, for example, and a bunch of cells together, this kind of thing. Um, there are people talking about near memory, uh, which I used to think is what this is, uh, because you put the computing near the memory, but it's not inside the memory, right? but it's very near. Um, but then, in I see in the commercial world, it's all very confusing because if you're inside a chip, it's in memory. Well, however, it's organized inside. If you're like, if you have a computer near SSD, it's near memory because well, you have a computer near the SSD. So I don't know what the answer is. I I, I suspect in the long run, the whole thing is just going to be called in-memory computing when you do this type of integration because people can't keep all these terms straight. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the physically here folks? No? Okay, any questions from the Zoom uh, folks? If so, please unmute yourself. Hello, this is Mauro, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, by the way, first of all, great talk. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, I have a question that is uh, more of a detail, let's say. Uh, in your machine learning example, you mentioned the uh, uh, voltage reduction, voltage mm -hmm. tuning. And the question is simply, uh, if you are assuming the same voltage reduction uh, on the logic and on the SRAM, or if they are somehow separated. Yeah, I didn't go into that part of the detail, but it's very difficult to reduce the voltage on SRAM because SRAM is a kind of low. Um, so in, in this particular design in the paper, I said I talk about um, we essentially we keep the SRAM voltage and therefore the power consumption the same um, and reduce the frequency and voltage of the logic. But that results in the logic part getting two 64 bit words of access per. Uh, cycle rather than one um, because the cycle time is half. Yes. I mean, the cycle uh, frequency is half. So we take advantage of that. Um, that's why there are two cores um, shown in the picture. But yes, this is a detail I didn't get around to saying, but the memory doesn't consume that much power to begin with. So reducing the voltage to the memory is a much less pressing matter than reducing the voltage to the logic Thank you.
Thank you, Maro. Any other questions? I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, so, uh, uh, when when you uh, have the memory stacking on top of uh, the logic, um, it behaves uh, as if it's a DRAM, but it has, let's say, uh, the kind of characteristics of a of a cache, very fast, you know, uh, very low latency, and I, I see the. TSVs, uh, they provide um, kind of, they, they help in that uh, decrease of latency. How about, for example, if in the, in the, in the tile, uh, if uh, there is, uh, let's say, if the data is far away from where you are going to uh, process, do you, the excess time is taking into account this worst case, or you have something like a non-uniform memory access kind of uh, design? Uh, um, okay, so it's, First of all, it's not like DRAM because it's SRAM and it's stacked on top. So the, the characteristic is no different than SRAM sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. And instead of going horizontally on, on chip wires, you're going vertically part of the way through TSVs. But because each layer is only 30 microns, um, the, the time through the TSV is relatively short. Um, the so this is just you you really want to think of the the tile as being a bunch of sram banks um connected to a, 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 a island of logic and in this case it's eight 32 bit banks per uh, per island of logic now the the because a tile dimension in the xy dimension is um, 0.7 in each 0.7 millimeter in each dimension. The maximum distance is very short, but the data in a the organization at the higher level for the whole chip is a cluster of computers. So you don't have shared memory because, like your cluster in the computer center, don't have shared memory either. When you talk to another um, computer in the cluster, you go through the network. In the on-chip case, you go through the on-chip network to get to the neighbor. So if depending on the kind of network you have, you can have more or less bandwidth. And it's obviously much cheaper to go to neighboring uh, memories than it is to go very far away. So you have an you have an issue, you have let's say uh, the nearer the data is, uh, let's say for the HPCG, do you organize, let's say, the uh, yeah, so it, it Pays. I haven't done the, the, the research on this um, yet, but it pays. It, it, so most of these high performance code have this characteristic where you do the computing inside the node and then you have this halo thing that you exchange with other people, the boundaries of whatever it is that you're computing. Um, and who you exchange with, um, you know, the, the physical location matters a lot. It matters in a normal network also, but less so because in a normal computing center, you have these factory networks, which is relatively symmetric. But in an on-chip case, the, you have, you know, it's a planar network, right? It's a 2D network. So you, it's much more efficient to go to your neighboring node. I mean, you can build high dimensional toroids and stuff on chip, but it doesn't change the fact that the guy far away is far away. And it's gonna take you a lot of energy to get there, no matter how, you know, how many dimensions your toroid has. Right. Yeah. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, you need compiler support to that. You need a, so, yeah, a high level, no, I do not have. I do not plan to do that kind of. That's part of the special sauce that whoever builds a particular accelerator um, is supposed to provide. Because the the design of the specific accelerator, you choose, you design the network topology yourself, right? Because every log, it's in the logic chip. So the logic chip is sort of the responsibility of whoever the product. Yes. Um, so you get to design different kinds of networks depending on your need and the routing algorithm and the algorithm altogether. 
then you're supposed to figure that out. Now, this is what people like Cerebus and GraphCore have done. <clears throat> they provide a software stack and have a very uh, proprietary network. Right? And I would expect people to do that the same for their niche accelerator. It's, it's not part of the platform. Um, in the platform um, architecture, I just provide nearest neighbor um, to the Taurus as an example. For you. Okay. Um, thank you. We are a little bit after 12, but uh, so any more questions or I'm around and available online, you know, an email. So you can um, write me if you have more questions, you can contact me. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have two questions on the last slide that you have, uh, actually. Uh, one before the text. I know you paint. Is is that uh, uh, is that your painting? Uh, this, this one. Oh no, this no. is not one. This is a painting of when I search for let a thousand flowers bloom. Oh. I find this. Okay. And the other question was about that. Is that from Mao or uh, it's a, the like say? Yeah. Well, the the real Mao saying is let a hundred. Uh, flowers okay. blossom or something <laughs> like that. It's not a thousand because they are better. Okay. But in English, it turned into that. <laughs> I do have a question. In the comparison you do against the NVIDIA car with the sparse matrix, mm -hmm. you said that there is a, a newer version of this with five nanometers. You know, if the if the newer version is good, well, because this is based on HBM2E and well, the well, everything is study HBM and there, there's coming another standard, the HBM3. I yeah. don't know any details. I, I have no more insight than, you know, I just grovel around on the web, <laughs> same as you. The thing is like the advantages on this one, because the HBM3, it won't be much more quickly on bang with this. A bit more well, you can, you know, you get 2x usually in these things. Otherwise, there'd be no point in making a new product. The thing is like the advantage, like the better performance here, you, you will say is because the less latency, the the more channels or a combination of it's it's combined, but there's a there's like a 10x difference in energy between it's more than a 10x difference energy between DRAM even HBM DRAM and SRAM or, or MRAM. Um, because right now, HBM is about three picojoules per bit. And, you know, some people say perhaps someday you'll get to two. But on, on chip SRAM, it's like 0 0.05 picojoules per bit today. And even with all this TSV stuff, it doesn't get more than 0.1 picojoules. So this is like a 20x difference in energy. So that energy is going to show up somehow in your product. I mean, if you make the, the DRAM 20 times more bandwidth, it'll get 20 times hotter. And then your refresh time will become more than your access, <laughs> more frequent than your access because it gets so hot. Okay. Thank you very much again, Peter. And uh, you are, you are, as you said, you are, you are around. So uh, please follow up with people. Uh, any questions you might have? Is is the slide post?